Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Romans, Romans chapter 12 this morning. We have two series of messages that are running right now from the pulpit here, and that is one, sermons from our favorite verses, and then sermons from verses we misunderstand. They might be our favorites, but we often get them wrong. Unfortunately, this is the latter one. This is a sermon from verses we often misunderstand. But what a glorious truth we find here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to ask this question and maybe let this question linger in your mind. What does it mean, the perfect will of God? Uh, Perhaps you've heard someone try to explain the perfect will for God, uh, and they might have even used this verse to explain it. They might have said something to the effect that God has a perfect plan for your life, and that if you don't go along with God's perfect plan for your life, you might fall into one of these secondary categories. You could maybe end up only being acceptable to God instead of perfect with your life because you're not living your life totally for him and and maybe if you're not maybe you're not even acceptable maybe you're just good you know <laughs> maybe you fall into the good will of God but at least you're not out of the will of God entirely some have have said it's more like a, a target you know that you uh, there's uh, there's being out of the will of God for your life and then when uh, when you the out, outer edge of the target you know is is the good will of God for your life where you're, you're sort of not in sin and living against God, but you're not doing a whole lot for him either. You're just sort of good. And then, uh, and then the next level in the target zone, you know, you, get, you cross over the next line and you get into the acceptable will of God, where now you're living for God a little bit, even though you're not giving him all of your life. And, and that's acceptable to God. But what he really wants is his perfect will for you, and that's right at the center. That's the bullseye of the target Uh, If this all sounds made up, I assure you it wasn't made up by me, but at the same time it is completely made up. None of this is founded in scripture. None of this is actually biblical teaching. Although I've heard very many people who I respect and who love the Bible who teach this, this is just simply not what the Bible teaches. And it certainly isn't taught in this passage of scripture. The idea that if you Um, you know, do certain, make certain choices in your life, you could ruin God's perfect will for you. And and now he had a plan for your life. And his plan was that, you know, maybe you become a missionary, but, you know, you committed adultery and now you can't be a missionary. So his perfect will is is ruined for your life. And all you can do now is just try to live for God and fill it, you know, be part of his acceptable will for your life or something like that. While I do admit that you know, there are certain sins that disqualify people from certain positions in, in the church. That doesn't mean that God's plan for your... Well, th- there's not even such a thing as God's plan for your life. There, that, that's a phrase we've made up. The idea of God's will for your life is, is a phrase we've kind of just made up. And even if there was a God's will for my life... We wouldn't see three different levels or different wills of God for us here. Look at the verse itself. It says, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If this was talking about three different wills of God for our lives, uh, then it would have to use, it would have to indicate that some way. Even in the English translation, it doesn't indicate that at all. It says, it doesn't say, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect wills. Of God, It says, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will, singular, of God. And there's another way, using the singular word will, that you could express what some people teach from this, and that is, prove what is that good, and it could also, it could say, if it wanted to express what some people teach, prove what is that good and that acceptable and that perfect will of God. That means if you take a definite article and put it with each one, then the singular will would go three times to each one, right? But since it's a singular will and it only has one definite article, it means that this is just talking about one will that has three adjectives, three descriptions of the will of God. And that is, the will of God is perfect, it is acceptable, and it is good. 
When we get to this, as we go um, line by line through these verses, <clears throat> we'll find e- even more information about these words that they don't, they don't describe different levels of, of, uh, accept, uh, of acceptance into you know, God's plan for your life. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. In fact, as I went over this in my head, I realized that this whole chapter needs to be preached in this but I doubt I'll be able to get through, cha- to, through verses 1 and 2 this morning. So I, I'm already saying we're going to have part 2. I, I acknowledge that, uh, you know, we know that this, this would be a very long sermon if I did the whole thing. But let's, let's ask the question, what, is, what does it mean when it says the will of God? Because usually when we hear the will of God, we think the will of God for my life. We'll kind of add that that prepositional phrase onto the end, the will of God for me. Um, and what we really mean is God's plan, and then we'll add on, to end, on the end of God's plan, we'll add that prepositional phrase, for my life, for me. What does God's plan for me? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as God's plan for you. That's, that's not how God's plan works. God didn't orchestrate everything in the world to revolve around my life, right? God doesn't have a plan for my life. God has a plan for all of creation, for all of the universe, for all of time. He has a plan. And I, in my little puny little life, get to be a part of his plan. But his plan is not for my life. My life is for his plan. And my life is going to, guaranteed, going to work out his plan. That's that's going to happen. He works all things after the counsel of his, his good will. Uh, God has a will, and it's for all of eternity. And his will will be accomplished. And my life is not really the focus of his will. It's not his will for my life. It's my life gets to be a part of his plan. And so when we're reading this and we're thinking about how God, you know, if we, you know, if you've ever been to a youth group, if you were a, a Christian teenager growing up, you, you've probably heard someone say, well, you know, listen, um, God's will, uh, you, you've got to follow God's will and who you're going to marry and what profession you're going to take, what you're going to go to college for and, and how you're going to serve him with your life, where you're going to live, you know, um, you, you've got to follow God's will for your life and all of those things. Well, I mean, I guess the sentiment is good. It's just not taught here that we need to seek God for the big decisions of our life. And if we accidentally don't ask God's help in big decisions, that what we're doing is ruining God's perfect plan for our lives. God doesn't have a plan B. God is still on plan A. Do you realize that since the beginning of creation, men have been screwing up? If I can use that phrase, that's sort of a colloquialism of our modern day, right? They have been messing everything up, right? Um, And God has not one time changed his plan. It's never had to change because God is sovereign. God is on plan A still, and his plan A is going to happen. when When we sin or make mistakes or do foolish things, God doesn't say, oh man, that really ruined my whole plan for their life, you know? Uh, Now I've got to go to my acceptable plan instead of my perfect plan for their life. (laughs) No, God has a perfect plan and your life fits into it. Well, the only question is how does it fit into God's plan? Right? Does your life fit into God's plan as a bad example for other people? You know? Or does your life fit into God's plan as a good example for other people? Is your life a sort of a warning? Don't do like they did to others, and that fits into God's plan for all of eternity? Or is your life a glory, uh, something that glorifies God and that you're doing right, you're following the Lord? That's really the question. But here's the thing, all of that's besides the point of this verse. None of, none of, nothing in this verse has to do with what God has in store for your future and uh, who you should marry, who you should, uh, you know, wh- where you should live, uh, the big decisions of your life, seeking God's counsel. All those are good. We, of course, should find wisdom in the Word of God for all of those kinds of decisions, but that's just not what we're talking about here. 
When we see the will of God listed, it is all, sometimes it'll be talking about God's ultimate plan for, for all things and, and everything. But almost, on, almost every time you're going to see the word will, or especially the will of God listed in the Bible, is going to be talking about desire, the desire of God, what God wants you to do, how God wants you to act. It's talking about how he wants you to act in purity, how he wants you to please him. And I think we'll see this just very obviously when we actually look at the context of the verse. There it is. There's the word you're waiting for, context. All right, let's go back to verse number one. I beseech you, therefore. Now, whenever you get to this word, when you're jumping in the middle of a passage, you get to the word therefore. Now you've got to pause and you've got to say, there's more context I need, right? As, as some have said, probably so much that you're bored of hearing this phrase, when you see the word therefore, you have to look to see what it's there for, right? And we've got to look and see why he's saying therefore, it's calling something back to, to mind. Now, in the book of Romans, we have a, a, an 11 chapter treatise on the gospel, explaining the details of what we would call in theology today, soteriology. But uh, to Paul, it was just the gospel. <laughs> and so for 11 chapters, he's explaining the gospel. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, his emphasis is on sin. Sin is pervasive. It's everywhere. All have sinned. It comes short of the glory of God. And sin keeps us from eternal life because we need to be justified in order to have eternal life. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 discuss this idea of of salvation or eternal life being granted, but only by means of faith. Because we have, when we have faith in Christ, we are granted the, the justification of Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ applied to our account, and uh, we are saved. We are, we are given eternal life. Chapters 7 and 8 talk about once we have eternal life, once we have come to Christ in faith, we continue to have a struggle with our bodies, with our, with our mind and our bodies wrestling back and forth, how we're, we're, we're saved, we're promised new bodies in the future, but our body right now wants to continue to sin, even though our spirits are saved, they're given to the Lord, and they want to do what's right, and so there's this tug of war going on within us, right? Chapter uh, 9, 10, and 11 then Paul talks about all of these concepts, the sin and the justification by faith and the, and the problem with sin after justification by faith. And he, he brings in the nation of Israel in chapter 9, 10, 11. And he begins to speak about how there is uh, this promise of God to his chosen people, the nation of Israel, that now because of everything he's laid out in the first several chapters, is it seems to be exclude some of the people of Israel because some people from Israel who are God's chosen nation don't have faith in God, have not trusted in Jesus, the Messiah, and therefore are not receiving eternal life. And so he deals with the question, how is it that God's chosen people are not receiving eternal life? Justification is by faith and God's chosen people don't all have faith, the people from the Old Testament. And he explains how how eventually God will bring it to a place where everyone who's left, the remnant of God's chosen people, will be those who have faith. And right now, God's chosen people are the church who are all people who have faith. And so all of this is dealing with this idea of salvation and what it means and what it does on a more intellectual level, sort of going to, going to the uh, Bible school with Paul and, and learning all of this stuff about salvation and the gospel. And then in chapter 12, he says, all right, now what are you going to do about it? I beseech you, or I'm begging you to do this because of everything I just said, all 11 chapters, because of the wonderful, he says this, uh, by the mercies of God, because God has been so merciful to us, because as I laid out in three chapters that we are sinners and we are destined for eternal judgment for our sin and because Christ stepped in and took our penalty and offers us justification and righteousness, uh, have, having a righteous account before God, if we will by faith trust in Christ 
And because of the mercy of God on us, even after we're saved, he continues to pour mercy upon us because even though we're saved, we also still sin sometimes and he's still merciful. And he just says, oh, and now because of all of this, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Now, he's talking about these, these next few phrases, the, the last half of this verse number one, is, is talking about the sacrificial system of the Jewish people and using that as a picture. And it says that we are to present, because of all that God has done for us, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, there were several sacrifices in the Old Testament. Well, I want to take you to Leviticus 22 um, to show you one. <clears throat> but uh, there were several different types of sacrifices, different names for different sacrifices. Uh, there was, you could categorize, and you see this throughout the book of Leviticus, you could categorize all of the sacrifices as burnt offerings or free will offerings. And Leviticus often categorizes them into those two different uh, groups, burnt offerings or, or free will offerings. The burnt offerings were the ones required by law. You, 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 commit, you committed some sin according to the law of Moses, and you had to go get a, a, a sheep or a goat or whatever it was required for that sin and bring it and offer it as a burnt offering. You had no choice. Free will offerings were things that you offered of your own free will. Now, some of these free will offerings were, uh, were, were vows. You would make a vow that you didn't have to make, but if you made a vow to God, you said, I promise to do this, I promise to do that, then you would have to fulfill that vow by bringing the, the, uh, whatever offering you vowed to the Lord. And then there's other free will offerings that were called uh, thanks offerings or, or sacrifices of thanksgiving. What a great what a great name for a, for a sacrifice, especially to talk about on this week as we're getting close to Thanksgiving. But if you look at Leviticus 22, you can see the requirements for these free will offerings, which is very similar, by the way, to what Paul is saying here. These free will offerings were things that people would bring, often because they were just so thankful to God for all that he'd given them. I mean, they were just overwhelmed with love and appreciation to God, and they thought, what can I do for him? To show my thanks, I'm going to bring an offering. And here's the requirements for the offering in Leviticus 22 and verse 17. It says, <clears throat> um, let's start in verse 18. Speak unto Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, what Whosoever he be of the house of Israel or of the strangers of Israel that will offer his oblation for all his vows, for all his free will offerings, uh, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering, ye shall offer at your own will a male without blemish of the beeves, of the sheep, or of the goats. It's important here that it says without blemish. But whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall uh, not be acceptable for you. And he goes on to describe the purity of, that is, that is required in that offering. It says in verse 21, Whoso, um, and whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings, excuse me, a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be per perfect um, to be accepted. If, it's, if this offering is going to be accepted, you don't say thank you to God by offering him the, the least of your sheep. You go and find the best of your flock. You find the best of what you have. You find one that is perfect, and that's how you say thank you to God. That's how you bring a free will offering. We could go to many places throughout the book of Leviticus, but you get the idea. Out of gratefulness to God, we don't say, ah, thanks God, here's, here's my little Charlie Brown sheep that looks like the Christmas tree, you know, on Charlie Brown. And, uh, and he's got hair missing and, you know, that might be great for a pet, you know, take care of that sheep and, you know, treat him well. But that's not the one you offer to God as, as out of thanksgiving is the idea. You're going to offer him one that's perfect without blemish and uh, was actually going to be used. In fact, this, this offering was going to be eaten by the, by the Levites. Uh, this is how they survived. This is how they um, supported the Levites was with these types of offerings. But now we go back to Romans chapter 12, and we see that Paul is calling on the people 
of in, in, the Christians in Rome, and he's, he's calling on them because of everything he's laid out, because of the great magnitude of God's goodness and mercy to them, because of all the kindness that God has shown to them, just because they're saved. We're not talking about, oh, God's been so good. He gave me two cars, and he gave me a boat, and he gave me th- three houses, and he gave me, you know. No, that's not what he's, he's not saying that. He says, you don't need all of that to know that God's been good to you. You just know that he's been merciful to you in salvation, saving your soul and giving you eternal life. And because of the great amount of God's goodness to you, then you should bring a offering. And he's, he's, he's calling on them to bring this sacrifice of thanksgiving to God, to be thankful enough to God to bring him a sacrifice. And here's the sacrifice he says to bring. He says to bring your body. Bring, bring you. It says, the word present here is interesting because that ye present your bodies. The word present here literally means to stand beside. And you might think, well, what does that have to do with presenting? Well, that's what they would do when they brought their offering uh, to, the, to the altar in the temple to be sacrificed. They would bring their offering and they would stand beside it and they would wait in line until it was their turn and then they would give their offering to be sacrificed. And here he's saying, come stand beside your body and say, all right, you're going to God. But it's a little bit of a different sacrifice. You're not going to put yourself on an altar and set yourself on fire. You are a living sacrifice, right? You are, you are still alive, but you're sacrificed to God. There's a, a picture here that this, not a literal sacrifice, of course. You are offering yourself to God. You're your ability to thank God is, is, is like the sacrifice in that you're taking yourself and offering it to God, but it's different in that it's living. And one of, the, of course, the problems with a living sacrifice, the reason that sacrifices had to be killed when, before they were put on the altar is because otherwise they'd try to get off the altar. And this is uh, some of our problem, right? As living sacrifices, we get on the altar and then we say, I don't think I want God to have this anymore. I want to crawl off the altar and Paul is saying no no you're presenting your body you're standing here and that's God's now and that's going as a living sacrifice to God Uh, it says next holy well why why holy because a sacrifice out of thanksgiving to God had to be perfect that's that's the requirement you if you're going to sacrifice if you're going to say thank you to God by living right, it's got to be holy. You, your body's going to have to be holy. You're going to have to live pure. It's going to have to be without blemish. Acceptable. There's that word again, acceptable unto God. This word means well-pleasing. Now, when we say the word acceptable, we don't always mean, I'm very pleased with this. You know, if, if, uh, <laughs> you know, if, I, if I brought my wife on our anniversary, if I brought her flowers and, and, you know, maybe a giant teddy bear or whatever, and she's looking at me, don't bring, bring me a giant teddy bear. But if I brought her that and she said, um, you know, that's acceptable, you would probably think, oh man, you did something wrong there, Josh, what would you do, right? Well, that's not what this word means. This word means well-pleasing. It's, it's different than what we would refer to as acceptable. What, what this means is, yeah, that's really good. I'm very pleased with that. That's, that's wonderful, right? Um, we don't use it that way today. So when it says holy, acceptable unto God, it means that this actually pleases God when we present our bodies holy to him as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And then it says, which is your reasonable service? Now, I think the, our instinctive, what we draw from that phrase, your reasonable service, um, I think we can, op, we can instinctively think of this as speaking about our, um, well, it's, it, it just makes sense that we do this, you know? It's, it's, it's reasonable that we do this. It's, it's only reasonable that I should bring this and give it to God after all that he's done for me. And I think that's a, you know, that's a fair sentiment. That's not, however, what this verse is saying, though. When it says reasonable service, it's talking about service or sacrifice or worship, and it's saying it's a different kind of service, sacrifice, or worship. It's, it's not a physical one. It is a, an inward man one. It uses the word logiken, which is, or, which is logikos, comes from the word logikos, which is, of course, where we get our word logic from. And it's saying 
This is a type of service that is from your reason or, or your inward man, your, your mind, the inside of you, not the outside of you. So the inside of you is bringing a different kind of sacrifice. It's, a, it's, sort of a, it's not a literal sacrifice is what he's saying. You're not bringing an actual lamb. You're doing an inward man service to God, a, a, a reasoned man, inward service to God um, instead of an outward man service to God. You're not, you're not bringing some sheep and slaughtering it. Well, why not? Well, because Jesus has already taken care of all those sacrifices. That's what the rest of the book is about, right? He's already been made, been made the sacrifice, and he's, and he's taking care of all the physical sacrificial needs, right? Now, you are going to give a reasoned sacrifice, a sacrifice from your inward man, the reason, the mental capacity of you, from the invisible part of you, the inward side, is going to now serve God by offering the outward part, the body, to him. It says this in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Now, this is important. This word conformed is a long word in Greek. I can't even remember to pronounce the whole thing, so I'm not going to try. But it's a word that just means take the shape of. It take, take on the shape of the world. Specifically, the world in this present age is what it's, the, the word there refers to. And here Paul is talking to people who are in the same age as we are, um, the same time period before Christ returns. And he's saying, if you're going to be holy, remember, holiness does not come by being made just like everyone else in the world. I mean, as, as, as a Christian, we should look at what we think is right and what we think is wrong and say, if that's equal to what the world thinks is right and what the world thinks is wrong, I've got a problem. Because if my holiness standard is equal to the world's holiness standard, then it is not equal to God's holiness standard. Because his standard of holiness is don't be like the world. Right? That's, that's part of his standard. You know, we have churches today that if you would go down the list and ask them about what is right and what is wrong, it would be identical to the rest of the world, you know? Oh, you know, uh, you know what? Um, premarital sex, that's fine. It's not a big deal anymore, you know? Oh, you know what? Um, homosexuality, no, it's not a sin, you know? Transgender, not a sin. You can just go on down the list. Abortion, no, that's not a sin. And you just keep going. And sooner or later, you've got to ask yourself, why is your standard for holiness the same as the world's standard for holiness? You've been conformed to the world. There's a problem. I mean, what, you know, I think that's pretty obvious. It's self-explanatory. What are we to do, though? We are not to be conformed to the world. We don't say, oh, well, you know, it, it might say this in the Bible, but I'm going to try to change things around because the world doesn't like this. We don't conform to the world. It says this, we are transformed. That's the word. Now, I can actually pronounce this one. Metamorphosis. Well, it's the word we get metamorphosis from. It's metamorphos. But metamorphosis, it means to be changed into a new image. And, and actually, it has the connotation that you're changed into something by looking at it. You're looking at it so much that you become like it. You, sort of like the, the phrase, you are what you eat, right? In this case, it's you are what you look at. <clears throat> and he's saying, you're, you're changed into a new image by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. What we've got to do as Christians, if we're going to say thank you to God for all of his mercy and blessing to us, we've got to say, I'm going to present my body wholly to you. And we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that holiness is not just whatever makes me feel good. Right? That's conformed to the world. Holiness is what God says is holy. What God says is right is right. What God says is wrong is wrong, and how I feel about it doesn't matter. Right? Because that's what we're called to do. By the renewing of your mind, turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Um, there's many places in Scripture we could go to sort of understand what is meant by the renewing of the mind. But I think it's, I think it's rather obvious the renewing of our mind comes to us from Christ. It says this in Philippians Chapter 2, I want to get to verse uh, 13, but we'll start 
in verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, meaning he didn't have to steal anything to be equal with God. He was already God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in, the, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So how do I renew my mind? You give it to the Lord and let him work in you to will of his good pleasure pleasure. And this brings us to what we've already concluded must be is the the interpretation of the last half of verse 2. It is calling us to live our lives in a way that is accordance with God's pleasure, with his desire, God's will, his desire for us to live. How are we to live our lives? Why should we live our lives in accordance with God's will? Because He saved us, (laughs) and we are bound now to give him an offering of thanksgiving. Next week when we celebrate Thanksgiving, remember that the way to say thank you to God is by giving your body as a sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing, acceptable unto God. And then look at what it says here. It says, we're transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Now, let's pause on the word prove for just one moment because... Again, we have another word in, these, in, in our translation here that isn't used the same today as it was 400 years ago when the translation was made. Um, the word prove actually means to show forth, not, not necessarily to, to, to prove for yourself, right? So when we read this, sometimes we say we prove what is that good. So that means I'm going out there and I'm investigating what... What is good and what is not good? Well, that's good, but you're going to find the answer pretty easily in the Bible. It's not super hard to find out what's right and what's wrong. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's literally written on tables of stone in the Bible, correct? Um, but rather, instead, prove means that when you are acting in this way, you are proving and showing others what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And these words, good, acceptable, and perfect, seem like different levels of something to us. There's good, which is kind of down here, and acceptable, which would be, you know, maybe a little better than good. And if you say, oh, that's good, oh, that's acceptable, and then that's perfect, well, you would think that's the same concept listed in different levels of, of, uh, of appreciation, different, different levels in the same concept. But rather, these words mean this. The word good is the same word that's used in Romans chapter 8. Turn with me, uh, keep your finger here in Romans 12, because we'll be going back and forth to Romans 8 just for a moment here. Um, Romans 8, which says this of all of these issues, um, this actually Romans 12, it seems to, at least the first two verses, seem to directly tie into what he's already laid out in Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 5 For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Remember, it's talking about the mind uh, that is renewed. He says, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. That means your mind is given to follow the desires of your carnal nature or your body. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, meaning your mind is following the Holy Spirit. You've chosen to follow the Spirit. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it cannot, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In fact, in Romans 8 verse 27, we see this statement, and he that searcheth the hearts, talking about, about how uh, God, the Father, searches the hearts, and he knows, it says, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will 
of God. So here again, we have the Holy Spirit making intercession for us in accordance with God's will. And then we get the verse that we all know and, know and love so, so much. It's verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Now this word good, there's several different words that could be translated as good in the, in, in the New Testament. When we use the word good, it can be used a couple different ways. I mean, we could talk about something that is pleasing, that, is, that, that pleases us, that is comfortable, that is fun. You know, you might say that was a good hot dog, you know, because it tasted good. I haven't had a good hot dog in a long time, actually. Maybe I should say good lobster or something like that. But you could say that was a good meal. You know, it, it pleased me. It, it made me happy. But then there's other ways that we use good. We could say, you know, Superman flies around doing good, right? There's a different type of good. I don't want to eat the things that Superman does. I'm pleased by a meal, but the other one is more of a moral good, right? He's doing something morally good, not just something that makes me happy, right? And in Greek, these words are actually separate words. And the word that's used here for good in Romans 8, 28 is the same word that he uses in Romans 12, verse 2, when he says, what is that good? He's talking about a moral good. What is morally right? He says, what you're doing when you've presented your body wholly to God is you're going to prove to the rest of the world what is morally right. You're going to be living in a morally right way and proving it outwardly. It's, it's going to be morally correct. It's also going to be, again, here's that word, accept, acceptable, which we've already discussed, means well-pleasing. So here it is. You're going to be morally right in the way that you act, and because you're acting morally right, you are going to be pleasing to God. You say, well, I want to say thank you to God for all that he's done, done for me, so I'm just going to say thank you. Well, here's a better way. Why don't you go out and live morally right, and that will please him. That will be well-pleasing to him. He's, he's very pleased with that. You see how these are not different levels of the same thing, but rather they're two different concepts that work together. God's will, when we follow it, meaning God's instructions for living, God's desire for how we should live, causes us to be morally right and pleasing to God, and then perfect, which means complete. So we're morally right because we're following God's instructions for our life. We're, we're, we're not conformed into the image of the world. We're using God's template for what is right and what is wrong. And then we are well-pleasing to God. And then we are complete, meaning completely morally right and completely well-pleasing to God. And you say, well, that's a high bar. Sure, it is. But this is God's desire for us. Should we not endeavor to reach it? I mean, will we ever be perfectly complete. No, Paul says this in the book of Philippians as well. He says, not as though I had attained, but I follow after. We can't ever be completely perfect, but this is our desire to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our service of our reason, right? Now, you might say, okay, but what is the will of God? What is it that is, are the, are the things that the, the manner in which he wants me to live my life. Well, this is the rest of chapter 12. But as I've noted, I'm only in two verses in, and we're totally out of time. So we'll have to do this next week. But I want to go through, and if you find, you'll find this, maybe you'll take some time this week, if you've got some time, to read through the next few chapters. But the next few chapters of Romans actually give us, I, by my count, 15 things that Paul is going to call on them to do uh, in order to present their bodies a living sacrifice unto God. He's introducing this saying, because of all that God has done for us, because of all of his mercy and love and grace to us, I'm calling on you to take your body and present it to God as a living sacrifice. And here is how you do it. And that's going to start in verse number three. Uh, but we can say this much, that the will of God is referring to God's desire for how you are to live your life. Not, not his foreknowledge of what's going to happen in your life, because, of course, God's plan for your life, you know, what, how your life is going to work out, is already factored in his foreknowledge. He knows all the mistakes that you have made and all the mistakes you will make, and he's already worked that all out, because he's 
perfect in his knowledge. But here, the will of God is referring to how God wants us to live our lives. And why should we live our lives for him? Because he gave his life for us. Because of the mercies of God. We should then desire this. We should be waiting on, I I think actually Paul wants his readers now when they get to verse 2 to be on pins and needles saying, yes, this is what I want. I want to be well-pleasing to God. I want to offer myself as a thanksgiving offering to him. Yes, tell me what I can do to please God with my life. And Paul's going to go ahead and answer that in the next few verses. I'll close with this verse in Romans 13, verse 14, because this is, in, in a sense, this is a sort of a conclusion to this passage, although he's going to add a few more notes. But the list of things he wants them to do sort of concludes in verse 14. Um, he says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision to, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I'd like to um, get into that in more detail next week, but here's what we're doing. We are putting on ourselves Christ's righteousness. We're living as Christ lived. If, if, if we have now taken our bodies sort of off, if you will, and said, here you go, that's for you, Lord. And he says, but you're going to take Christ and put him on. And now you're going to live like Christ. That's your example. That's your picture. That's how we please God with our lives. We'll get into more detail next week. I want to ask you just a few questions in application. Number one is simply, are, are, are you, have you recognized all that Christ has done for us? I mean, maybe, maybe you're here today and you've never, as Romans 10 says, called on the name of the Lord, as submitting to him as Lord, Uh, for salvation. Remember, it is only by faith that we have justification, that we have eternal life. If you've never chosen Christ by faith, today would be the day to do that. Or maybe it's more for you, it's something more like, man, I just had sort of gotten so far away from thinking about it that I, I haven't been grateful for the salvation that God has given me like I should be. And what are you going to do about it is the final question. What are you going to do about all the goodness God has given you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd help me. Help us. We see the great mercy that you've given us. And we desire, naturally, to do something for you in response to all of your goodness to us. And for some reason, the hardest thing is the thing that you want us to do, and that is to live holy, to present our bodies, not, not, not to make excuses for the things that we want, our pet sins that we don't want to have to deal with, but rather to say, I'm transformed into the image of Christ. I want to present my body holy, whatever it is that God wants from me, That's what I want in order to say thank you for all of his mercy to me. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to do just that. That we would commit this very day to present our bodies, to stand beside them at the altar as living sacrifices unto you, holy and well-pleasing, acceptable. We know this is our reasonable service. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.